Welcome everybody to the Lord's Son this morning. We see each one gathered with us and we look to the Lord for his help as we meet in the house of the Lord. The announcements are on the church bulletin. Just to remind you that next Lord's Day after the morning time we'll have the annual general meeting with the presentation of the accounts for last year. And then I forgot to put in the bulletin that well permitting we'll have a busy bee this incoming Saturday. So this incoming Saturday at 10, in a few weeks time, a congregation are using our building for a wedding. And so we'd like to have the property uh, tidy for that wedding. So if the weather is in our favor, uh, the busy bee will be this incoming Saturday at 10. And the rest of the announcements are in the bulletin. I'm going to read some words from 1 John chapter 3. I think many of you could recite these well-known words. 1 John 3 and verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and the thought not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. As we gather in the Lord's house today, we rejoice in the great mercy of God, that we are the sons of God, that though once we were Outside the house of God, the family of God, and condemned, we have been brought in, to declared to be the Lord's sons and the inheritors of the great inheritance laid up for us in glory. May we give thanks then unto the Lord in our worship today. We'll seek the Lord's face in prayer. Our gracious Father, we give thee thanks for this, the return of thy day. We thank thee for each soul that has been able to gather in thy house and we pray dear lord that thou will be pleased to come here today and we pray that thou will be pleased to minister to the hearts of each one of us and stir us up we pray after thyself and enable us then to worship in spirit and in truth we pray in our saviour's name We're going to sing the words of the hymn number 60, the hymn number 60 on the page 200, the page 200, hymn 60, Jesus, thy joy of loving hearts, thy fount of life, thy light of men. Number 60, and we'll stand as we sing.
Seek the Lord's face again, please, in prayer. Our gracious Father, how thankful we are for our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for Him who is the one that fills our hearts with joy. O oh Lord, we thank Thee for Him who being the eternal Son of God was pleased to take true human flesh made like unto us with the exception that he came without sin. We thank thee that he came with that purpose to reconcile a people unto a holy God. And, o Lord, we thank thee for that day when the believers in our midst here were brought to taste and to see that the Lord is good. For that day when we were brought to see that all that we needed was supplied in Him. And, o Lord, we thank Thee, O Lord, for the one who has made that full atonement for sin that the wrath that was our due was taken by our blessed Saviour. He is born in the way. We thank thee that we can then say that because of Christ, we have peace with God. O oh Lord, we look to thee today, that thou will be pleased to come and reveal thyself to us again. O oh Lord, we pray that our eyes will be opened again to see the great wonders in the gospel of our Saviour. That in all of our hearing and seeing today, that it will be our blessed Lord that we see afresh. O oh Lord, we cry to Thee that we will be enabled to live for Thee in this ungodly age. We pray that we will live to thy great honour and glory. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that as we pass through various trials and troubles, that we will always prove thy grace to be sufficient for us. O oh Lord, we pray today for those that are passing through times of great struggle, times of health issues, times of various turbulence. We pray, Lord, that thou wilt come and minister to thy dear children. And Lord, we pray that in the shadows that they will see the love of their blessed Lord. And we commend to thee today those in our midst who are unconverted. And Lord, we cry to thee that thou wilt open the hearts of those that are still blinded in their sin. And Lord, we cry to thee that thou wilt bring the unconverted <coughs> savingly to thyself. We thank thee that there's none too hard for thee. And we cry to thee that thou wilt even deal with the hard hearts, the stubborn hearts of the unconverted, and bring them savingly, we pray unto thyself. And so we pray for our land. O oh Lord, have mercy upon it in all of its sin. We cry to thee that there will be a time of refreshing from the Lord in our land again, that there will be a time of return to the truth of God's holy word. And so, Lord, we cry to thee that even this little congregation will be used to that end, that we will be instruments in thy hand to a time of reviving. Come down and revive us in this time here this morning. Uh, build us up in thyself, we pray. O oh Lord, deliver us from spiritual stupor, and we pray that there will be that burning fire within us after thyself. We pray. 
and our Lord's name, great name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, and we're turning this time to the Psalms, so at the beginning of the hymn book, the Psalm 32. Psalm 32 on the page 29. Psalm 32 on the page 29. Blessed is the man to whom is freely pardoned. All the transgressions he hath done, whose sin is covered. Are we to thank the Lord for his great grace in the gospel? We are a blessed people. And let us sing these words then. On to the Lord's praise, singing down to the end of the verse 5, ending with the words, forgive thee. them into the palace, saith the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal multiply transgression and bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven and proclaim and publish the free offerings. For this like of you, O 
O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. And I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want of bread in all your places, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And also I have withholden the rain from you when there were yet three months to harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city, and I caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have smitten you with blasting and mildew, when your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, with hammer wood, devour them, yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have sent among you the pestilence that shall come to naught. They prepare to meet thy God, seek the Lord. And the As we sing this time, the offering for the work of God will be received. If you didn't come prepared for an offering, please just let the bag pass by. So it's the hymn 222. 222, page 266. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore, Jesus ready, stands to save you, full of pity, love and power. 222, and we will stand together, please, as we sing. So, right, men seated. <laughs>
to turn, please, to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs and the chapter 30. We're going to look today, with the Lord's help, at the last section of this chapter. Proverbs chapter 30. <coughs> Reading from verse 29. Last Lord's Day we had some congregational reading. I think we'll have that here. Um, so rather than doing alternative verses, we'll just read it all together from verse 29 through to the end. So we'll read, please, together. There be three things which go well, yet four are comely in going. A lion which is strongest among beasts, and turneth not away for any. A greyhound, an he-goat also, and a king, against whom there is no rising up. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood, so the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. And may the Lord bless again the reading of his holy word. We'll seek the Lord's face, please, in prayer, and let us look to the Lord for his help as we come around the word. Our gracious Father, we thank thee for thy holy truth, and Lord, we cry to thee today, that thou will be pleased to take these words of Scripture and to apply them to the hearts of every hearer. O oh Lord, to that end, give that needed help of the Holy Spirit of God, we pray. O oh Lord, be our teacher. Draw the lost to thyself, we pray in our Lord's great name. Amen. Amen. Harry Ironside told the story of two preachers that were passing by a grocer's shop and there were three baskets of eggs. The first basket had a sign reading, fresh eggs, 24 cents a dozen. Then the second basket had a sign, strictly fresh eggs, 29 cents per dozen. And then the third basket had the sign, Guaranteed Strictly Fresh Eggs, 34 cents a dozen. And so one of the men looked at the other and said, Does that grocer have a problem with understanding the word fresh? And Ironside used it to say that it is thus with many scriptural terms that to our forefathers had an unvarying meaning, but like the base coins have their, uh, today lost their values. And in the whole context of what Ironside was saying, he was talking about repentance. Uh, and he was emphasizing that we need to be absolutely clear as to what the scriptures actually mean when they refer to repentance. Repentance is an entire change of mind. It involves a change of direction. And so it is something more than merely saying sorry and carrying on absolutely unchanged. Repentance is this entire change. John the Baptist, as he set out in his ministry, he said, Repent, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Our Lord Jesus in his ministry said, Except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And the call to sinners still is today. Repent. And that is the great theme of this last section in Proverbs chapter 30. Repent. Sinners are to repent in light of what we have in Proverbs 30. And also, every believer is to know an ongoing 
repentance, an ongoing humbling of heart before the Lord. And we've seen through this chapter that Hagar was a man that was able to see lessons from the natural world <coughs> around him. So last time we saw that he was able to learn from the little creatures. And in this closing section, he again uses this <laughs> Hebrew poetic method of saying, for three things and yet for four, and is to draw our attention to what he is saying. And it's also reaching a great climax of thought. And in this particular three, yea, four, we have three animals, and then a king is spoken of. I, in the in the fourth mention. So we have in verse 30 a lion and then in verse 31 a greyhound and there is some uncertainty over what particular animal is in view. The particular Hebrew word is translated there greyhound. The Hebrew word does have the idea of being girt at the loins and some then have felt that what is in view is actually a, a racehorse or a war horse. Some modern versions refer to that as a rooster, and that's based on an ancient uh, Greek translation. Uh, so we have the, the lion, and then the greyhound or the horse, and then also in verse 31 we have the he goat. And after that, then, we have the mention of the king. Uh, and the question has to be asked, what is the connection between these the three creatures, the lion, the greyhound, and the he-goat, and a king? Well, if you look back in verse 29, it says there be three things which go well, yea, four are Comely in going. Now the Hebrew word well and the Hebrew word translated comely is the one Hebrew word. And the word does have the idea of comely, beautiful. Some feel that as it's used here with verbs for movement, that it has the idea of stately. And so it seems that there is a contrast between how they move that they go well, and that seems to suggest a slower movement, but then they are comely in going, that is in a faster movement. And so some commentators suggest then we are to take all three of these to be kingly, that in some way each of them is suggesting what a king should do. Be like. Now these three creatures certainly are spoken of in scriptures in different ways. And so if you were to follow the word lion, for example, through the Bible, there are times it's spoken of very favorably. And the righteous are as bold as the lion. Our Lord Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But then it's used negatively. Satan is like the prowling, roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So we have to ask what point is Agar making in this particular section? And I believe it is all to be regarded as one section. So we have these three comely creatures. And then it speaks of the king at the end of verse 31 and the king against whom there is no rising up. Against whom there is no rising up. And it would be a foolish thing then to try and withstand the lion. Thinking of the war horse, it would be a foolish man that would stand in front of the galloping war horse and not expect injury. Or to try to stand in the he goat when he's absolutely intent on moving forward. Yet there would be some that would try to defy the king against whom there is no rising up. Verse 32, If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, lay thine hand upon 
the body. Uh, I believe what Edgar is especially emphasizing here is that the king that is in view is the greatest king of all. There is a king against whom there is no rising up. It's our Lord Jesus Christ. And yet some would lift up themselves against him. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, for if thou hast thought evil, and the words thought evil there can also bring out the idea of plotting against him. And Zwager says, if this is true of you, if you in your pride have lifted up your hearts against the King of Kings, if you have sought to scheme against him, it's time to lay your hand upon your mouth. Lay your hand upon your mouth. That is another way of speaking in Scripture of repentance. And so in Job 40, in the verse 4, Job said before the Lord, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand <coughs> upon my mouth. I will no, uh, no longer argue for God. I will be silent before him. I repent. And so the challenge then in this closing section of Proverbs 30 is this. Why do you resist the great king? And the command then is no longer resist. Put away the resistance. Be repentant. And so I want then to look at a closed mouth before the king. And I want to think first of all then of submission to God's providences. And I want to address the Lord's people very especially in this First point, submission to God's providences. As I've mentioned, in verse 29, there's two references to going well. Go well, comely in going. And as we take this and apply it to the Lord, it was said of our Lord in his ministry, he did all things well. Everything the Lord did in his ministry was right and good. And everything that the Lord does in your life and mine today is right and good. He goes well. He is comely in his goings, in his dealings with us. Now every one of us as God's people know that this is true. But we can all affirm together that everything that the Lord does is right. And yet, practically speaking, in our lives, there are times when we do not submit to this. There are times when we resent the various provinces that have come into our lives. And so it might be a difficult family circumstance. It might be a severe health problem. It might be financial issues or employment issues. Now, when those things come, very rarely, if ever, do we say, Thank the Lord for bringing these things into my life. The Lord is doing all things well. We would never have planned these things for ourselves. And we may be somewhat resentful that the Lord brought us to these trials. But we may be resentful that we find ourselves in these difficulties. And so there is a king against whom there is no rising. And yet we have responded, as is described in verse 32, if thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself. And of course those words lifting up thyself are speaking of right. When the Lord has done right, we have lifted up ourselves against him. We have resented his providences. 
And so we might say something like this. Why me? Why do I have all of these difficulties when others don't have them? Or maybe we even say something like this. I, I, I don't deserve this. This should not be happening to me. That's pride. May even be that the next part of verse 32 is also true of us. If thou hast thought evil, as I mentioned, the words there can be translated as thou hast been scheming or plotting. And maybe there's some painful circumstance, and we would plot as it were that it might be undone. Of course, I'm not in any way speaking against trying to resolve our problems. Nor am I saying that when you're sick you shouldn't go to a doctor. I'm not suggesting that at all. But we must never think that we can change what God has purposed to do. So I'm not denying our own personal responsibility. Nor am I denying the personal accountability of those that sin against us. But we cannot reverse what the Lord has purposed to come to pass. And so I mentioned Job. Uh, Job said that he would put his hand to his mouth. Now thinking of all of the troubles that Job had endured with the deaths of his family, the loss of property, the loss of his own health, we ask ourselves the question, who was behind it? Was it God? Or was it sin? The Bible's answer to that question is yes. Satan's hand was all over it. But praise God, God was sovereign in it all. God had permitted Satan to do what he had done. He didn't permit him to go beyond what was permitted, God was sovereign over it all. So remember in the book of Job, Job was exposed to the reasoning of his so-called friends and what miserable comforters they were. And so Job then, we can understand, could begin to think in his own heart, well why me? The Lord in the latter part of Job then comes and addresses Job directly. And in Job 40 and verse 5, Job answers, Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Okay. And then in chapter 42 and verse 2, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee, who is he that hideth knowledge, that I counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye saith thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, and repent in dust. And ashes. Job says, I'm no longer going to reason against God. I submit. And you see, Job came to recognize that resentment of providence does of necessity carry with it resentment of the Lord Himself. We cannot say, I resent that this has come into my life. not signify I resent the God who has brought it into my life. Nahum recognized this. Nahum 1 verse 3. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. The clouds are the dust of his feet. Daniel 4 and verse 35. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand 
or say unto him, What doest thou? Who can say to God, What are you doing? Or who can say to God, You must refrain from doing it? So in Romans chapter 9, we have that great so chapter on the sovereignty of God. And much of that chapter has to do with the sovereignty of God and salvation. And I'm sure that chapter is precious to many of you in account of that. And yet we are to see it not just in that one sense of the sovereignty of God in whom he saved. So it certainly is speaking of that. But the Lord's sovereignty in all things. Romans 9 verse 19. Who will say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Who hath resisted his will? And today, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall we think for and say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? And so Paul is teaching us in Romans chapter 9, among many other things, that the response of the Christian to troubles is to be very different than the response of the world to troubles. And so, if you pass through very deep waters, the unconverted may be saying to you, where is your God good God not? And so they see in trials, they wrongly see in trials, evidence, and of course it's not evidence, but this is what they falsely see, evidence that God is not good. But we are to see in all of our providences whether they bring joy or tears that God does all things so how does Proverbs 30 then apply to us these latter words? Thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, for if thou hast thought evil, lay thine hand upon thy mouth. No longer speak against the Lord. No longer speak against the King against whom there is no rising up. But indeed say, the Lord does all things well. Submission to God's providences. But I want to see then secondly with you, submission to the gospel's demand. Submission to the gospel's demand. And if we look at verse 32 then, from the point of view of the unconverted, if thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, or if thou hast thought evil, now isn't this exactly what the unconverted do when they are confronted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. When the unconverted are faced with the demand that Jesus Christ makes, repent and believe the gospel. How do the unconverted respond? They do foolishly in lifting up themselves. They do foolishly in their pride in their boasting. And so you think of the man that went to the temple to pray, the Pharisee in the parable that our Lord Jesus told. And as he went to the temple to pray, he ought to have been thinking of Almighty God. For the temple was the place where God's holiness was to be made manifest. And so when he went to the temple, he ought to then have been thinking in that sense of the great king against whom there is no rising up. But what did he do? He lifted up his swelling heart and he boasted before God of all of his supposed greatness. I fast. I do this thing. I do that thing. And most of all, I'm not like that rascal, that public and that tax collector over there, who is full of pride. 
And that sense, surely he thought of evil. He thought that a holy God could have his just and holy demands met by his best efforts. That a holy God could be appeased by the payment of tithes or by, by fasting. That a holy God could be appeased by the mere say of prayers. What an evil thought before Almighty God. Your very best cannot appease the holy demands of God. And so as I've said, <clears throat> verse 32 is a very accurate description of the whole thinking of the sinner as he is described with, as he is challenged with the gospel. If thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, for if thou hast thought evil. And so here then is the command of God to the sinner today. If there's one in the meeting, and this is a description of you, you have lifted up your heart against God. You have thought evil. It's time to lay your hand upon your mouth. It's time to be silent before God. No longer argue, but rather today cry for mercy. Acknowledge them like that tax collector in the temple. I need the mercy of God. God be merciful to me, a sinner. The sinner that continues to resist, resists at his peril. And this is set forth for us in the final verse of the chapter, verse 33. <coughs> Surely the churning of milk bringeth forth butter, and the ringing of the nose bringeth forth blood. So the forcing of strife bringeth, the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. Now each of the verbs in this verse are using the same Hebrew word churning, ringing, forcing. It's translated for us in different ways in the in our English <coughs> translation because we don't use the same verb to describe each of those movements. But you think of the churning of butter, the churning of milk to make butter. Probably not many of you churn milk these days to make butter. But if you're going to do it, you have to agitate the milk. And so there's this agitation to make the butter then it speaks of the ringing of the nose perhaps it is the thump that's in view here though in light of what has gone before and after it seems it's more than just the thump of the nose that the person has actually grabbed the nose and they're twisting it it brings forth blood and so Eger says like manner, the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. And so the agitating of the milk will in much time bring forth butter. That severe agitation of the nose, it will bring forth blood. And if you stand against a holy God, what are you doing? Forcing wrath. Withstanding a holy God to his face and it will bring forth strife. Bring forth strife. Uh, as you think of the butter and the blood notes, there is something that they share in common. That is, it cannot be undone. You can't get butter back into milk. And so while not many of you, I'm sure, have made butter by churning, none of you have made milk from butter. You can't get butter back into milk. 
And while you can stop a bleeding nose, you can't get the blood that has come from the nose back into the circulation within the body. It cannot be undone. If you think of what is being described here as far as the sinner is concerned, the forcing of wrath bringeth forth strife. The Hebrew word for strife here, it has the idea of a legal confrontation. And it is a word then that is used to describe judgment. The sinner in life has withstood the pleadings and the command of the gospel. The sinner in life has stood against the king against whom there is no rising up. And in all of that he has been agitating the wrath of God. Just like the churning of butter. It's as if he comes to the face of God and he's so defiant it's as if he's twisting the nose of God. And the nose in the Hebrew language has to do with that. He defies his word to God's face. And Edgar says this is so solemn because the force in the wrath bringeth forth strife. It will bring a legal contention. And the sinner then, if he goes on in his defying of Almighty God, if you're without Christ, pay attention to this today, dear lost one. The sinner, if he dies as he has lived in defying God, he will discover God to be the great judge, but also the great witness against the sinner. The one that presents the evidence, the accuser. So as the sinner wrestles against the gospel today, as the sinner refuses to repent, what an awful thing he is doing. The force in the bride bringeth forth strife. I've mentioned how the sinner is to lay his hand upon his mouth. Doesn't it remind us of those words in Romans chapter 3, where it's speaking of the, the rightness of the law of God, the rightness of the justice of God, Romans 3.19, we know that what, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. As we take those words and apply them to the judgment day of God, we're not limited to that, but if we apply them today to the judgment day of God, Every mouth will be stopped. All the world that has rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ will be summoned in their guilt before a holy God. Isn't it a tragic thing today when we hear those that say, well, on the day of judgment, if there is such a thing, this is what I'm going to say to God. I'm going to say to God, you should have given me more evidence. Or you should have done this thing or that thing. They'll be silent. All the world guilty before God. Therefore, dear sinner, today we plead with you. Be silent before God today. Before God today, say, yes, you're just a man. All right. Acknowledge before God that you cannot in yourself meet those just demands. And thereby take hold of Jesus Christ. And so while you put your hand over your mouth, with your hand lay hold of Christ. Isaac Watt said, my faith would lay her hand on that blessed head why like a penitent I stand and there confess my sin. And he's referring how in the Old Testament there would be the laying of the hand on the sacrificial animal 
It signified my sin taken, laid upon another. And so today, dear sinner, you're to come to Christ and say, my only hope is that my sin would be taken and laid on Jesus Christ, that he then would take his righteousness and lay it upon you, impute it to your account. And Joseph Carroll said, the Lord lays down his rod when we lay down our cross. And he casts his sword out of his hand when we cast ourselves at his feet. And why is it so? Because Christ has pierced the sinner. Christ has taken the wrath that was our due. Oh dear sinner, if thou hast done foolishly in lifting up thyself, if thou hast thought evil, lay thine hand on thy mouth. Come today to the God of mercy. Come today and be saved. We trust the Lord to bless his word in all our hearts. We're going to sing in closing please 269. 269. I've wandered far away from God now. I'm coming home, the paths of sin too long I've trod, Lord, I'm coming home. We'll sing the verses 1, 2, and 6. The verses 1, 2, and 6, as we stand and then remaining standing for closing prayer.
those of our loved ones that are so far away from thee so stubborn in their sin oh break them we pray lord we cry to thee that they will be brought unto the lord for salvation have mercy upon the lost humble our hearts as thy people today we pray lord we cry to thee that we will be those that are humbled also in thy sight we thank thee for the refreshments bless those to us we pray i bless our fellowship together i bless the, the sunday school minister in that season as well we do ask now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory in the church by christ jesus throughout all ages world without end